Thanks for the introduction. Thanks for the opportunity to uh, share some of my recent data here. Uh, when you're thinking about metritis, we are dealing with uh, acute systemic units that's caused by pathogens and it generally will occur in the first 10 days postpartum and will be characterized clinically by a reddish to brownish fetid water uterine discharge that's usually a campaign of fever and other clinical signs. And we, why do we care so much about this disease? First of all, is because it has a remarkable economic impact in the dairy farm. The estimate cost, it has been over $300 for each case of mistrice that is uh, related to cost deal with reproduction, milk loss, culling, and treatment. Besides that, it's considered one of the most uh, detrimental disease that cause impact of animal welfare. So the cows will be remarkably painful, they will smell bad, they look bad, and they, they are a cause of concern. A third concern it, it comes from the fact that it is a disease that has to be treated with antimicrobials. And when we look at the effects of, this is a study that I did back in 2014 when I was doing my PhD at the University of Florida. And one thing that we, we treat cows either with ampicillin or with sexual food to the bad lactonic drugs. And what we saw in that study, in which is parallel what we see in the literature, is that 33% of the cows treated will fail to cure. Okay, that, that's not different even when you think in oxytetracycline and other drugs that have been used for like penicillin to treat metrite. So a lot of cows do fail to cure. And we are not clear about why. So in the last year or early this year, we published a study where we, we, we were looking at the microbiome of cows that were treated with uh, cefstiofur and ampicillin. And we did see a difference uh, between the microbiome of the cows uh, that cure and didn't cure the disease. So one of the things we noticed is that the diversity in the region of the microbes, there were uh, the cows that, that cured the disease, they had uh, a higher diverse and a higher uh, richness index compared to the cows that didn't cure. And then they had more uh, bacteroids, sulfazobacterium. Uh, than the others. So that, that brings me to, to the question, what are these calls that these antimicrobials are not curing? Is that a problem related to antimicrobial resistance? Or is that perhaps a problem related with the arsenal of virulence factors that the microbes uh, have? So why is over one third of the cows failing? Is it, what, is it one of this related to antimicrobial resistance? So the question that we pose is, can we generate novel insights to understand the cure failure of metritis? One way that we uh, were able to, to deal with this problem is to use what we call whole genome shotgun sequence. So what's that, how is that different, for example, from the, the popular target 16S RNA sequence? Well, the target 16S uh, will be quite different. In the whole genome shotgun sequence, you're sequencing the whole country, so you're you're sequencing every single gene they are in your sample. When in the 16, you're spe sequencing specific regions of the gene. So you're gonna have enhanced detection of the bacterial species. But besides that, you're gonna be able to detect other genes. For example, the genes that I'm interested on, antimicrobial resistant genes and the virulence factor genes. And you're gonna have improved accuracy of the species you're gonna be doing compared to the 16S. Uh, a limitation, as I said already, it's the, the you're going to sequence only a single uh, region of the gene with 16S, and, we, and you don't do that. With, so we're expecting to have better accuracy when we do that. So my hypothesis was the cows that fail to cure metrides have a distinct microbiome, microbiome and the resistome and virulome that cows then attain metrides after treatment with metalactamics. Our objectives were to use this whole genome shotgun sequence to characterize the microbiome and the resistome and the virulome in uterine samples of cows that attain or fail to cure, cure metritis with beta lactamics. Uh, so we used 24 primiparous cows that were diagnosed with metritis. We randomly assigned them to either receive cestial or ampicillin. And then we used uterine swabs to collect the DNA from their, their sample of those metritic cows. So we collect that 
at the time of diagnosis and then six days. So those cows were treated for five days with either ceftiofur or ampicin according to label. And then those samples were submitted to be uh, sequenced using the high seq lumina. Once we get the data, we use the Amazon web uh, service to clean up the data, to align the data. And then we use Kraken to do the taxonomic classification of our genes. And then we use Diamond and Megan to do the nucleotide assignment. And then we use the, co the CAR, that is the comprehensive antimicrobial resistant database to determine our antimicrobial resistance in those samples. And then the virulence factor, bacterial pathogens, uh, data bank to, to classify our genes. So what we found, we found over 306 billion clean reads uh, and 299 gigabytes of data to analyze. That led to over 800 microbial genomes that we found in that sample. And we had 131 different antimicrobial resistant genes in that, in, that, in that group of samples. And also we had over 500 virulence factor genes, okay? Uh, let's start with the microbiome, uh, okay? What we found was that the major difference were uh, over time. So the bacteroidets, Prevotella, other types of Fusobacterium, and Tenerella, they, re they reduced over time. And Porphyromonas, in agreement with the study that we published earlier this year, increased over time. But as expected, we didn't find much difference between ampicillin and ceftiofur. They are both beta-lactamics. So the changes that they cause in the, the microbiome, they uh, were similar. Uh, the second part was cure. That was one of the things we were very interested on. And what we were able to see is that the cows that cure, they had a higher incidence of strep, uh, relative abundance of streptococcus than the cows that didn't cure. Uh, we did what we call, this is a composite data analysis. So we want to, like each data point represent the whole population of microbes of each cow. So this is between the two antimicrobials. As expected, they didn't differ. Uh, nor the, but the, as expected, so you had cows that uh, were before treatment, after treatment. Obviously, the antimicrobial did affect the, the population of microbes in there. And we see that the data was different between the two groups. And the same thing we saw for, for cure as as we show with the streptococcus of the species, when we look at the whole cure things and agreeing with our previous study, there was a difference in the microbiome, the whole overall microbiome, those cows that cure from the cows that didn't cure. And some of the players were Fusobacterium and Mycoplasma that participated of that whole. The rhizostome, the, the, the genes relate to antimicrobial resistance. So they were predominantly dominate by tetracycline, which is the trend log most of the studies done with food animals. That's where you're gonna see most of the antimicrobial resistance animals are tetracycline. That's very common, followed by aminoglycosides and beta-lactams. But the, I think what I want to point out in this figure here is that they are quite consistent across our cows that cure and didn't cure before and after. So we didn't see striking differences uh, we look at the, like, at the mechanism of those antimicrobials, and the most common one was the target protection for antibiotics, followed by the antibiotic efflux. And once again, what I want to point out here is that there were no striking difference between our cows that cure and the ones that did not cure from the tritis. Uh, and then we look at the relative abuse. Uh, over time, tetras, this TAT, T, and W, they were increased. So the cows that, uh, and then when we look at the cure effects, only, there was only a time effect. We couldn't find a difference for antimicrobial resistance between the ones that cure and didn't cure. Uh, when we did that analysis, the discriminant analysis, they it, it put together all the data. We didn't see an effect of treatment, nor an uh, effect of antimicrobial type, not an effect on cure. They're, they were all similar. Uh, what we looked to was the, also the abundance and the richness and the diversity. So how many of those genes were. And for antimicrobial resistant genes, unfortunately, we were unable to find any difference between the animals that cure and didn't cure. Wasn't our uh, major characteristic that was perhaps leading to cure or failure to cure fermitritis. We did this correlation analysis that we were 
uh, plotting our richness of antimicrobial resistant genes against the, the, the bacterial genes. Uh, and the, the line for the animals that cure and uncure was pretty much flat. There was no much difference between the two. Then we look at the virulence factor genes, the genes that are the arsenal of uh, ways on which the pathogens can subvert the host immune response and cause disease. Uh, here we saw that there were so, some difference. For example, one of the differences that we, we saw is the animals that didn't cure before, they had more of this, this typical TUF, which is a gene uh, for virulence factor for streptococcus, if you remember the one I was talking about earlier, that was increased in the animals that cure. So there was a difference for that one. Uh, when we did our discriminant analysis for antimicrobial type, time and cure for virulence factor, we couldn't find a difference. But when we look at the richness, we, we saw that the animals that failed to cure, they, they had more virulence factors present. So there was more virulence factors and they were more diverse, uh, they're more, they're more and they were more diverse. And when we did our correlation analysis, we did see that the animals that didn't cure, they had increased richness of virulence factors in comparison to the, the, the gen genus richness. So this is a way to, to make sure that you account for the contribution of the microbes and the virulence factors. So what we were able to conclude was that the microbiome of the cows that cure from metritis is different than the cows that didn't cure from metritis. The uterine rhizostome was dominated by tetracycline resistant genes. And the, res the rhizostome chains were restricted to few of these antimicrobial resistant genes over time. But it was not influenced by cure. So cure was not a big factor for the antimicrobial resistant genes. Uh, we found no difference in antimicrobial resistant richness and diversity and nor for class were found between the cows in failure or attain cure. For the virulence factors though, we did find some difference in abundance and we saw that the uterine virulence revealed that cows that failed to cure from the disease have greater richness of virulence factor for the same microbial taxa than the herd mates that attain a cure. Uh, taken together, this data suggests that the virulence of the strain of the microbes are pivotal for the metrized prognosis after treatment. They are more important, seems like, than the antimicrobial resistant genes. I would like to thank the USDA that funded, hatched to fund this, this study, Stone Ridge Dairy Farm that allowed me to conclude this study, and the College of Veterinary Medicine, University of Illinois that uh, has uh, provided funds for my ICR that allowed me to conduct part of this study as well. With that, I'll be happy to entertain any question. Thank you very much.